Hello, welcome back to the channel. My name is Lisa Elvin Stoltari, and I'm a genealogist and a passionate traveler. Over the last year or so, I've been featuring each vigil of our king's daughter and getting to know their stories a little bit better. There are over 700 of them, so we've got a long way to go. We're on episode 168 today, so we've come a long way. Um, but before we begin, let me show you ways you can support the channel. The first three keep you in the know. Subscribe, like, and notify. Super easy. The next three are ways to help the channel grow. Coffee, Etsy, and Patreon, all are ways of showing your support. I want to thank the subscribers who have done that um, and really, really means a lot to me. Um, a lot of you actually go on my website and donate there as well. So I appreciate all the love and support that I have been granted. So thank you again. Let's get started. And um, our feature of this episode is a viewer request, Marguerite Hilde. And um, when I looked in my files, there she was, my best friend. This is one of her grandmothers too. So let's get to know Marguerite a little bit better. So Marguerite was born August 30th, 1645 in Paris, France. She was baptized at the parish or in the parish of Saint-Sulpice. Her parents were René Herdin and Jeanne Serré. She is from Ile-de-France, which is part of what Paris is. So that region is called Ile-de-France. Um, and then um, we have the district or the arrondissement. Uh, which is the circle. That's what it actually means. And Paris is laid out in circles, as you can see. She is part of the sixth district. Um, and the present church that is there, Saint Sulpice, uh, it was actually rebuilt in 1646. So the construction began at that time. So I'm wondering if if uh, Marguerite was either baptized somewhere else, but this is her parish church, so I wanted to, to uh, definitely demonstrate it to you. Um, the sixth arrondissement is an arrondissement that is uh, often referred to as Luxembourg because it, it, the Senate um, is there, um, and we also have the garden, um, the Senate gardens there, and we also have, um, it's situated on the Rive Gauche, of the River Seine. So it's a very, very prestigious place. Very, um, you know, historically it's been very much cultural and educational. Um, a lot of universities are, are um, found in the sixth and we also have theaters and, and cultural museums, that sort of thing. And also the cafe society that would have produced people uh, that would have been excited people like um, Jean-Paul Jean Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, François Seguin, all the, you know, the very famous French writers and philosophers and thinkers are, um, would have congregated here in the, in the sixth, you know. Um, so this is kind of where Marguerite is coming from, this kind of beauty and, and, and also of intelligence. So let's find out how Margaret evolves. So Margaret comes to New France on the ship Le Jean-Baptiste de Dieppe. Um, she sailed from Dieppe, and so June 18, 1665 is when she landed on the shores. There is no mention of parents or money. In other words, we do not know if her parents were alive, uh, but because there is no mention of a dowry, it, it bespeaks that it's possible that her parents were in, impoverished or, she, or that they had passed and she didn't have any dowry, so this was her last chance, if you will, but we don't know the circumstance. But we do know that she arrived here in 1665. The groom that she would select and who selected her was his name was Nicolas Verriol Le Lebecas. He was born in 1637 in Dieppe in the region of Normandy. Uh, his parish uh, would be Saint Jacques, which you can see on the bottom here. His parents are Nicolas Verriol and Perrette Roussel. Uh, you can see the shores of, of Dieppe are, you know, renowned uh, because of the Second World War, but also um, the church where he, the church where he would have been baptized, presumably, would date from the 12th century. Very, very old place. It's known. It was first noticed as a fishing fishing village in 1030. It became at one point the number one port in mid-century France. Another claim to fame was its uh, revered school of cartography, i.e., map making. 
in the 15th century. And two graduates from that school left for the New World and established the first French colony in the New World in 1564, if you can believe it, Fort Caroline, which predates St. Augustine. So they were there. So Nicolas, how did he make his way? So Nicolas would come to New France. Uh, he was a sailor and um, obviously probably went back and forth. Uh, you know, on those expeditions. He was confirmed in Quebec City by 1660. In other words, saying that this is, he was definitely there by that time. Well, as befits a sailor, they were married at a place called Cap Tourmente, which is a beautiful, as you can see, it's right on the St. Lawrence. This is their marriage record. Um, and um, December 1665 is when they were married. So she had arrived about six months prior. So this is kind of interesting. Um, they do settle in Bouperi, um, but I want to show you the 1666 census. That's why when you're doing genealogy research, you always have to verify, you know, like, are there mistakes? Does this make sense? Well, we have Marguerite Yelde. Okay, that's, we know it's her, but she's with the wrong guy. It, that's not her guy. We know that Nicolas Verrieux is um, there. He is listed as a matelot, which is a uh, term for sailor. And uh, by the 1667 census, they correct their error. So Nicolas um, Verrieux is 30. His wife, Marguerite, is 20. Nicolas, their son, is one. Jean de La Font, he's a domestic. He's 20. So they have someone working for them which is kind of neat. And they have eight alfalfa. So he, he did actually have, you know, five years to kind of build his, his uh, foundation of his home and, and offer this to Marguerite. So they have eight alfalfa, which is about, I would say four to five um, acres of land at least, uh, possibly closer to six. So the area of Beaupré has been inhabited since the beginning of the New France colony. And in the seventh century, the sailors from Breton, uh, they landed on the coastal plains and reputed, like, this is what they said, oh, le Beaupré, which means, oh, the beautiful meadow. And this is how it became known. Um, the fuse farm of Beaupré has been in use since at least 1636. So Beaupré, when the Beaupré Company was established, its parish was formed out of two of the oldest parishes of Quebec, St. Anne de Beaupré and St. Westchine. Its population in 1666 was 533, comparable to Quebec with 547. So it was at one point a thriving community. This is actually a picture of it today. But I also wanted to show you that there is an incredible Saint Mont Saint Anne uh, is found is one of the biggest ski resorts in Quebec and that is where it is located in Beaupré. So the kind of that's their claim to fame. Well they didn't stay in Beaupré very long. They actually moved to the island of Ile d'Orléans. Those regular viewers know how often we come back to this island. As you can see, it is very close to Quebec City, about three miles as the crow flies, as they say. And the island is um, subdivided into six different sections. And it's very important when you're looking at the island to remember which section of the island your people um, either moved to or stayed in or, you know, kind of ran around because we have St. Petronille, we have St. Pierre, St. Fanny, which is the largest and oldest, St. Francois, very, very prominent, St. Jean and St. Laurent. So all of these are districts within the island. And as I say, they each have a church and they each have records. Uh, these two bottom pictures are pictures that were taken on a recent vacation that a friend of mine took and he shared with me these pictures. You can see the beauty of this island. Uh, it really has a somewhere in time feeling. Um, the island itself was known by different names. It wasn't always Ile d'Orléans. Sometimes it was called Grande Ile, Sainte-Marie, Saint-Laurent, but eventually it was actually changed in honor of the son of King Francis uh, the first, Henri the second, who happened to be the Duke of Orléans, and so, y voilà, Ile d'Orléans. So, obviously, most people in with French-Canadian roots can trace their ancestry to at least, at least one person who is a founding 
uh, family uh, from Indonesia because it really is a microcosm of the rest of Quebec uh, because they started there and then they would gradually grow into different, um, you know, I, I have traced families from Seja, from Indonesia all the way to California. So it's, it's just a remarkable journey that they took. And so they started, many of them were living on Ile d'Orléans because of the fact it had that kind of French feel to it, very fertile, agricultural, and it was uh, um, near the sea, all of that. And that is where Nicolas Nagarit would end up. So Nicolas, who was 40 and his wife by then was, four, you know, 36. So you love how these census takers, the women get older or younger. Their children were Nicolas, 15, Marguerite, 10, Angelique, 8, Mary three, Joseph, five months. Michel, they have another domestic who is 40 years old. They have one gun and six farmers, so about four to five uh, acres of land. They would go on to have nine children together. Nicolas, their firstborn, married Marianne Mesny, had four children, one of whom uh, made it to adulthood. He then married Marie Madeleine Duchesne and had five more children, all of whom made it. Marie would die at the age of eight years of age. Marguerite uh, would marry Jacques Baudet and have eight children, five of whom made it. Angelique would marry Claude Pierre Landry and have 13 children, 12 of whom made it. Marie would marry Antoine d'Andurand and have six children, all of whom would make it. Joseph would marry Marguerite Boutou and have eight children, five of whom would make it. Madeleine would marry Pierre Fougère and have 11 children, seven of whom would make it. René would die in infancy and Jean-Baptiste would die before the age of one. Nicolas would pass away at the age of 77 in 1714. He and Marguerite would have been married an astonishing 48 years. Marguerite herself would pass away six years later at the remarkable age of 75. As of 1729, they would have 108 descendants, of which my viewer and um, my best friend are among them. And here are some of my resources that I use. La Société des Filles du Roi, the Quebec Genealogical E-Society, Nos Origines. Let me talk to you about Nos Origines this time. It is kind of a collaborative wiki tree approach where people are contributing. Um, I have found the information to be reliable um, for the most part and um, really, really nice the way that they kind of link up the, the trees. So please have a look at that. If um, you know, you're just starting out, you may find uh, the answers to some questions that you didn't even know you had. Uh, Genealogy Quebec, of course, is the ancestry of Quebec genealogy. Migration, another fantastic website, uh, and Facebook. Fille du Roi Descendant Group, please have a look at that as well. So I've listed the, um, the links uh, in the notes so you can have a look at that. And with that, we end episode 168. I love when these stories, I love when there's drama, but I also love when it's just, they get married, they live a life, they build a life, they're together 48 years, they have 108 descendants, and they die, you know, fairly close together. So they had enough time to really build something and really be together. So I am, uh, I'm grateful that Marguerite had that kind of a life. She, you know, obviously had to make sacrifices, obviously lost children, but she and her husband um, managed to endure and survive to a fairly older age for the people of the time. So um, we thank her for her sacrifice. We thank her for her contribution. We are grateful that she came to our shores and we bless her memory. Until I see you on episode 169, au revoir.